in Ukraine. He will have to withdraw forces that were in Ukraine or going to Ukraine to support an offensive to try to defend the Russian homeland and push Ukrainians out of that homeland. Mm. Um, I just wanted to play a little bit more of what Putin said uh, to his to his to his meeting and to the nation uh, about you know you heard him say this is probably a negotiating tactic by the enemy and this is how he expanded on that. Take a listen. What kind of negotiations can we even talk about with people who indiscriminately target civilians, civilian infrastructure, or try to threaten nuclear power facilities? What can we even talk about with them? Uh, Ambassador, I didn't know who he was referring to, Ukraine yeah. or himself. I mean, that surely takes the Hutzpah of the Year award uh, for <laughs> reflecting exactly what he's been doing for the last uh, nearly 10 years, frankly. You, you, you beat me to it. I mean, this from a man who launched a war that has had a catastrophic effect on the second largest by geographic area country in Europe. Almost 15 million Ukrainians either killed, wounded, driven from their homes as internally displaced persons, or refugees from their country. Hospitals blasted, schools, you name it. And for the Russians now to claim that this is terrorism by the Ukrainians in response to a war that the Russians and Putin himself started, that is what's going on. Mm. And also, clearly, the Ukrainians need to do something, right? We have been reading all these reports from the front lines over the last several months, a thanks in great deal to the United States and, frankly, President Trump's uh, influence not to send the weapons that they needed to defend themselves. So what do you think? The U.S. has already said this incursion does not violate their red lines on military aid to Ukraine. Where do you see this going next? I mean, is this going to be a major new strategic tactic? How can the Ukrainians keep up an invasion into Russian territory for very long? Well, I think what this reflects, Christiana, and I, I'm not a military expert, but as I understand from my former colleagues and, and friends who are, the Russians and the Ukrainians both are, in face, are facing entrenched positions on both sides in Ukraine, and it's very difficult to make even small tactical advances. What, what the Ukrainians have done is found a weak spot and made progress and blasted through a weak, a, a weak spot in the Russian defenses and claimed, as President Zelensky has said, a uh, 1,000 square kilometers of, of territory. It's what the Russians have been trying to do in Ukraine uh, you know, since since the war started, is to capture that territory. And as for bargaining leverage, which is what Putin calls it, again, failing to uh, failing to acknowledge that this all stems from a war that he started. This is a uh, a, a response, a defensive response by the Ukrainians that that captures territory that the Russian government has been using to blast civilian targets in Ukraine. Um, as I mentioned when I introduced you that you've written a, a new book, Midnight in Moscow, and it talks, you talk about working not under, not just about under President Trump, but also presumably your interactions with, uh, with Putin as well. Uh, you recount kind of a, an amusing story that when, uh, you know, President Trump talked to you and you said you wanted to go to Moscow, he looked as, at you as if you were nutty. What was that moment like? Why did you want to go there? Well, at that point, as I, as I explained in the book, Christiane, I've been Deputy Secretary of State for almost three years, and very stressful job, and I was, I was looking to, uh, to make a change. And at that point, John Huntsman, our ambassador in Moscow, had come back to Washington, this is the summer of 2019, to tell the President, Secretary Pompeo and me, that he was leaving his post in Moscow to run for governor again in Utah. And the thought occurred to me that this was a position for a variety of reasons that I might, uh, I would like to, uh, to assume, uh, and I've, I've been a lifelong Russell file, uh, and so it was a way for me, and one way to get off the hot seat as Deputy Secretary of State, and I know that saying moving to Moscow is, is not what people would think of as, as getting off the hot seat, but I explained in the book why I wanted to do it. But as you know, President Trump 
uh, this was in August of, of 2019, when I saw him, we were coming out of a meeting in the cabinet room at the White House, and he'd been asked uh, by a reporter whether he was going to nominate me to be ambassador to Russia, and he said yes. Uh, and then he later, after that media scrum, came up to me and said, you really want to do this? And he thought, at the time, he thought that sec then Secretary Pompeo was forcing me out as Deputy Secretary, which was definitely <laughs> not the case, because he couldn't understand why anyone in their right mind would want to leave a beautiful office on Mahogany Row at the State Department to go to cold and hostile Moscow. But that was, that was my choice. I really wanted to go. You know, a lot of people would say there's a lot of things that the former president doesn't really understand. He's talked about, you know, ending the Ukraine war in 24 hours. He talked about getting Evan Gershkovich back in, I don't know, in, in a record time, no deal. You know, you know how he is. What do you think right. the policy would be if he were to come back into power? What would the, the, the Russia and Ukraine policy be, do you think, under future, again, President Trump? Well, I think we saw a signal of that, Christiane.